Welcome everyone. Glad to see you on my channel. Today I will tell you about an unusual story. An amazing story about companionship and love. I wish you a pleasant audience. Carrie Thompson loved her six-year-old daughter Katie and would take her for a walk to the city park or the zoo whenever it was her day off. Today they opted for the second option, which seemed preferable. Upon arriving at the stationary zoo, Mother and daughter began to walk from one enclosure to the next, admiring the curious animals that walked around in the spacious aviaries. After the main tour, they fed the majestic swans in the pond and treated the ubiquitous squirrels with cookies, who jumped from branch to branch and amazed visitors with their agility and grace. Katie loved spending time with her mother, who was her closest and dearest person. She wanted to grow up as quickly as possible and become an adult. But most of all, Katie wanted to get rid of the limp that had been bothering her for the past year. As it happened, she had broken her leg in a fall from a small tree. Her bones had not reattached properly, so she was now limping noticeably when she walked, which made her already difficult life very difficult life very difficult. Deep down, Carrie blamed herself for what had happened, and not a day went by when she didn't think about it. Oh... If I hadn't been so busy cooking in the kitchen, things would have been so different. I would have been different, the unhappy woman thought with tears in her eyes. Fortunately, little Katie did not focus on her disability, and while her dreams remained only dreams, was enjoying life and laughing infectiously as a child. Glancing at her daughter from time to time, Carrie couldn't hold back a sorrowful sigh. At such moments, the woman remembered herself at that age, and a wave of memories immediately came over her. Carrie's life was not an easy one, and she had her own rather good reasons for thinking so. Remembering the difficulties of life with her ex-husband Henry, Carrie relived the events of those years, which had left a deep, unhealed wound in her soul. In this case, she couldn't say that before the wedding Henry was a fatal beauty or a seductive ladies' man. It's just that there was something in the guy's character that willy-nilly appealed to the lonely orphan girl. And Henry, of course, turned out to be a guy and immediately paid attention to the modest beauty. A librarian aiming to get her heart for himself. Henry was from out of town, coming from the big city, where he had already made a nuisance of himself to his parents. They had deliberately exiled him to distant relatives in a backwater town in order to dislodge their son's irrepressible arrogance and protect him from the temptations of the big city. Once he saw Carrie at the supermarket, the guy decided not to delay the moment of acquaintance and immediately offered her to go with him to the movies in the evening. From surprise, the petite beauty was confused and quite unexpectedly yielding to Henry's insolent assertion. She agreed. That night, Carrie, for the first time in a long time, felt happy. The guy came on the date with a bouquet of scarlet roses and appeared before her as a gallant gentleman, showering his companion with a lot of compliments. The screen was showing an uncomplicated movie with a worn-out plot, but it is unlikely that young people remembered at least one frame of it because they were passionately kissing in the back rows of the theater. It was the kissing places that became the starting point in their rapidly developing relationship. So quite naturally, after that memorable evening, Henry and Carrie saw each other almost daily, with each meeting getting closer and closer and closer. The culmination of their stormy relationship was a night spent together in a hotel, after which Carrie began to consider herself a legitimate fiancé of Henry. Unfortunately, deep down, the guy didn't share her opinion and would have preferred to continue to lead a promiscuous life unencumbered by a serious relationship. The news of Carrie's pregnancy, for a time, sobered the passionate lovers. But then, Henry pulled himself together and, after brief hesitation, proposed to his beloved. Deep down, he did not want this marriage. But even more, he did not want to be called a coward, afraid of responsibility. Although, everyone who needed to know well understood that this marriage was strictly an arranged marriage and not out of love. It was only after starting a family life, Carrie realized what a fatal mistake she had made. 
It was that the spouse of the girl was cruel and overbearing man who was used to command those who were inherently weaker than him. In the end, tired of Henry's endless nagging and claims, Kerry ran away from him and filed for divorce, which freed her from the family tyrant. But first she still had to share her grief with him and shed a lot of tears. Few people knew that in the depths of her heart, the woman kept a secret that was painful and unpleasant for her. Six years ago, she almost lost her newborn daughter two months before the doctor's due date. And it was not the fault of the obstetricians or the medical staff of the maternity ward. Throughout the pregnancy, Carrie felt great and was not afraid of the impending birth, which seemed to her as something natural and inherent in every woman in the world. At the same time, the girl had to steadfastly tolerate her husband's snide remarks, disappointed with her visibly changed figure. You're beginning to look like a clumsy cow. You're about to start mooing, Henry, the beauty lover of women, said in anger. In the end, it was her husband's taunting that caused the girl to go into premature labor two months before her due date. The doctors had to fight not only for the life of the newborn baby, but also for the life of her mother as a result of the internal bleeding. Fortunately, Carrie and her baby daughter, Katie, were saved. But when the exhausted mother saw the newborn baby with her own eyes, her heart ached with pity. The little girl seemed so small and fragile that tears immediately came to her eyes. Don't worry, honey. You'll see he'll be healthier than any of his peers. The obstetrician on duty said, seeing the frightened look on the girl's face. In response, Carrie gave the doctor a wry smile and fell into an anxious, painful oblivion. The fact was that the woman loved her newborn baby with all her heart, and no external imperfections could diminish her maternal feeling. Unfortunately, while Carrie was asleep, Henry appeared in the room, who more than anything else wanted to see his newborn daughter. But when the man realized that the baby was born premature, his lips contorted into a contemptuous grin. Here you couldn't even give birth properly. You rotten vessel, he grumbled angrily, looking at his daughter. At that moment, the man was seized by anger, which subsequently led to even more problems than he was having now. Henry's first thought was to abandon the baby, but then, after weighing the pros and cons, he decided to accept what had happened and wait for Kerry to be discharged from the maternity ward. Carefully pretending to be a loving husband, he acted as if nothing had happened, thus once again skillfully deceived his wife. At one point, Kerry even thought that things would get better and she could live a normal family life without mutual resentment and recriminations. But of course it was not so, and as often happens, trouble knocked on the door unexpectedly, foreknowingly. It all began when Henry was fired from his job about six months after the birth of his daughter. And so, as might be expected, the shaky balance in the Thompson family came to an end. The fact was that the firm where little Katie's father worked had been declared bankrupt with all the ensuing circumstances. Wage arrears, the employees, of course, were not paid, which further embittered Henry. Kerry tried her best to support her husband, who took the loss of his job very painfully. The woman knew that in the eyes of an enraged Henry, the whole world was painted black, and every other person was his enemy. Well, be patient, honey. You know that this company is not the only one. You'll find something else. They'll take a guy like you with arms and legs to any office, trying to support her husband, Carrie said. As an understanding and compassionate woman, Carrie did not rush her husband to choose a job, giving him the opportunity to adapt to the new reality and come to his senses. But to the great distress of his wife, after five months, Henry not only did not find a job, but also refused to solve the problems associated with his future employment. Instead, the man sat all day long at his laptop in the arms of a bottle of something hot. At first, Carrie didn't want to see anything wrong with that, believing that her husband just needed to rest and gather his thoughts. But as time passed, Henry was still unemployed. At the same time, abusing alcohol, spouse could unduly yell at his playful little daughter or even raise his hand at her mother. 
Not a day went by without Henry's use of the bottle being followed by a terrible brawl in his house, with breaking of dishes and all the circumstances that went with it. Why are you doing this to me, Henry? You know I work part-time as a librarian, and I can't provide for my whole family alone. I sincerely feel for you and try to help you, but I'm not a magician after all, Carrie said, choosing her words carefully. In response, Henry instantly changed his face and, spicing up his speech with a foul language, turned into a fire-breathing dragon sweeping away everything in his path. It seemed to him that the owner of the firm where he worked had done him a great injustice, and now the whole world owed him. But most of all, Kerry was afraid that, in moments of anger, his spouse crossed all acceptable boundaries and did not allow even the idea that he could be wrong. Unfortunately, the most frequent witness to Henry's moral decay, the scandals of his rampant drunkenness, was his young daughter, who, because of her mother's job at her mother's job at her mother's library, spent most of her time at home with her father. At some point, after another drunken brawl by a troublemaker spouse, Carrie caught herself thinking that it couldn't go on. That's it. I'd had enough. I wasn't strong anymore. Let him do what he wanted, but forget about me. It wasn't enough that my childhood had been ruined. It wasn't enough that my daughter had to go through something like this, Carrie thought, taking advantage of Henry's oblivion in another alcoholic stupor. The woman packed her bags and, together with her daughter, left the house she had grown tired of. Leaving her husband, she was well aware of the fact that she was burning behind her all the bridges that linked her to the past. But on the other hand, she had no other choice. No matter what, Henry was the closest person to her, the one who gave her hope for something good, tender, and sincere. But sometime sooner or later, everything comes to an end. Kathy's soft voice brought the young woman out of her sorrowful and extremely distressing memories. Mom, can I buy some sweets? You know, a bun or, or a cake? Of course you can. What are you talking about? Just buy it yourself, will you? You're a big girl now, said Carrie with a smile and gave her daughter some small bills. Katie eagerly took the money and, limping, made her way to a nearby kiosk with refreshments and sweets. At that moment, the smartphone in Carrie's pocket beeped, alerting its owner to an incoming call. Oh, bad time again, the woman whispered. While talking to a colleague on the phone, the woman stepped aside and lost sight of her daughter for a while. She was not worried about Katie. This was not worried about Katie. This was not the first time she had been to the zoo, and she knew how to behave in such places. In the meantime, Katie approached the kiosk with all kinds of delicacies and mouth ajar, began to stare at the display case with interest. This abundance made the girl's eyes light up and her mouth water with hungry saliva. Katie didn't know what to choose. A custard tart or a large gingerbread cake with marmalade? The girl didn't have enough money for both treats, and she had to get something to drink, too. Suddenly, Katie's attention was drawn to the soft shuffling of someone's feet behind her. She turned around and saw an older man standing a few feet away from her. It was difficult to determine his exact age, but he looked about 70 years old. The man had a hood on his head, which served as both a hat and protection from possible precipitation and wind. The man was thin and pale, and his face showed a clear expression of longing and universal fatigue. There was an unspeakable sadness in the old man's eyes that touched the girl to the core. Kathy looked at the old man in confusion, then stepped closer and cautiously asked, Grandpa, are you sick? Do you want me to buy you that big gingerbread with marmalade? Can you see the frosting on it? The old man looked up and looked at the girl. Then he thought for a second or two and with embarrassment, lowered his head and said, Thank you, honey. I'll be very grateful to you. I'm so hungry that my stomach is stuck to my back. Without a second's hesitation, Katie immediately handed the clerk the money to pay for the gingerbread and soda bottle she had chosen. The old man's eyes lit up with happiness. His lips treacherously trembled, and his hands shook like a paralytic. Thank you very much, good girl. May your life be good. Not like mine, the man whispered, 
and with great care, accepted the sweet gingerbread out of Katie's hands. Not wanting to embarrass the old man, Kathy returned to her mom, who had just finished talking on the phone. Mommy, can you imagine? And there's a hungry grandpa standing at the stall, with a hood over his head. Won't you scold me for buying him something to eat? The girl asked cautiously. No, of course not. Why should I scold you? You did everything right, daughter. Especially since I'm still going to buy you the one you picked out originally. Before you met Grandpa, Carrie replied with a smile. Soon mother and daughter were standing at the kiosk, where the saleswoman, with her trademark smile on her face, repeated the little girl's order. After that, Carrie approached the man sitting on the bench, and after a polite greeting, carefully sat down next to him. The stranger had a hood over his head, so that his face was visible only up to half. Where exactly he had put the gingerbread bought him by the girl, it was unclear. Whether he had already eaten it, or whether he had put it away in his pocket and left it for later, it was difficult to understand. The man looked unkempt and looked like a tramp. Half covered by the hood, the old man's face seemed vaguely familiar to Carrie. But the woman could not yet remember exactly where she had seen him. Nice daughter you have. I had a daughter too. But she's probably all grown up now, and she lives in a different city. The stranger was the first to break the silence. Yes, raising children is the real happiness of parenthood. And you should go and see your daughter, Carrie replied with a smile. At that moment, she involuntarily shifted her gaze to the old man's chin and lower cheekbones. Carrie looked at him and couldn't believe her eyes. No, it's just an optical illusion. Or maybe it's just a coincidence. Try to figure it out. The woman thought, trying to cope with the excitement. Still unable to take her eyes off the old man's face, she literally drilled him with her gaze. The thing was, Carrie had seen that face before, and the realization of it sent her into a state of deep shock. Gaining the courage to dispel the last doubts, the woman abruptly pulled the hood from the old man's head and became numb to what she saw. Carrie shuddered and, shrieking, involuntarily took a few steps back. An older man with gray, slightly sad eyes and a strong chin on a pale, wrinkled face was looking at her. He was an acquaintance of Carrie's from his former life, and so all doubts about this one vanished on their own. Unsure of what to say at this point, Katie looked questioningly at her mother. But there was really nothing to say, and there was probably no need to. Carrie's mind blurred and her thoughts flowed back, taking her back to the time when she was a mischievous little girl like her daughter is now. Memories and images coalesced, forcing the woman to relive everything that had happened. Carrie was born into an ordinary family in which her father worked as a driver and her mother was a hairdresser in a beauty salon. Her childhood was not deprived of small joys, which all children in the world love so much. Despite the fact that a lot of wealth in the family was not, her parents never deprived Carrie of gifts and tried, at least from time to time, to fulfill her desires. The future seemed so bright to the girl that she mistakenly assumed it would always be so. Everything changed in an instant, when the couple were killed in a cruise shipwreck which left their daughter Carrie orphaned. Since the girl had no close relatives, and distant relatives did not show any concern for the girl, the walls of the orphanage immediately loomed in front of her. Having lost her mother and father, the girl did not immediately realize that her parents were dead, and for some time mistakenly believed that they would return soon. It wasn't until social services placed six-year-old Carrie in an orphanage that she realized her life would be different from now on. Her mom would never make her pancakes and cottage cheese again, and her daddy wouldn't pick her up and drop her to the ceiling. Now Carrie's new home will be an orphanage, and her friends will be the same destitute orphans as she is. But the girl could hardly have known that fate had a new trial in store for her, one that would prove even more difficult than any that had gone before. Not a day went by that Carrie didn't dream that one day she would be taken into foster care. But after two years within the walls of the orphanage, 
she finally lost faith in her adoption. On top of that, the older orphanage residents were very vocal about adopting babies who, because of their age, have no memory or understanding. It's true. I'm almost six. Now no one will want to take me in, thought Carrie sadly, unaware that things were about to change. About a month later, an older couple, both in their forties, showed up at the orphanage and decided to adopt a little girl about six or seven years old. As soon as they looked at Carrie's picture in the file, the couple said with one voice that they wanted to adopt her. Andrew and Ashley Clark had been married for 16 years, but had never been able to have a child. Neither doctors, nor elite clinics, nor elite clinics, nor expensive treatment helped. The only way out was to get custody of their child, which would change their lives for the better. So with all the paperwork, Andrew and Ashley were able to get Carrie out of the orphanage within a month. The girl loved it very much in her new family. From the first days, Carrie was surrounded by the love and care that she had not known for several years. Gradually, the memories of her biological parents faded away, leaving a few blurry images and fragments in her memory. Ashley turned out to be a loving mother who immediately found common ground with Carrie. Andrew also kept up with his spouse and took a very active part in the upbringing of the baby girl. It seemed that the happiness of the Clark family was just around the corner, and to feel it, all you had to do was reach out your hand and get what you wanted. But, as is often the case, trouble came knocking at the door at a moment when you didn't expect it at all. In fact, it was just an illusion, hiding a future of unpredictable twists and turns and pitfalls. The family's troubles began suddenly, with an event that forced them to reconsider their attitude toward life. One day, during another trip to the river with her parents, 11-year-old Carrie decided to go for a swim, and without waiting for her mom and dad, went into the water. There were a gang of kids splashing around, one of whom swimming further than he was supposed to, where to his horror he realized that he could not go back. The boy's legs treacherously cramped, and his head began to slowly sink into the water. The situation was becoming critical, and if it were not for Andrew's immediate reaction, tragedy would have been unavoidable. The man was an excellent swimmer, and within moments he had covered the distance separating him from the boy. At the very last moment, Andrew grabbed the teenager's hand, prevented him from sinking, and helped him to swim to the shore. A little later, they were warming themselves around the fire, laughing infectiously, trying not to think about what had happened a few minutes before. Pulling the teenager by the arm, Andrew unwillingly noticed the large mole on the wrist of his right hand. Wow, nature gave you such a gift. I guess you'll be happy, the man said. The teenager was embarrassed and guiltily lowered his eyes. Since then, they never saw each other again. That day, after such a heroic rescue of the boy, Carrie called Andrew Daddy for the first time, and the realization of this made the man really happy. Before that, the girl had never used the diminutive form of the expression and limited herself to Daddy. Unfortunately, it was the event on the river that opened a string of problems that enveloped the Clark family in a thick veil. First, Ashley became seriously ill, who soon showed signs of a terrible hereditary disease, an effective cure for which mankind had not invented. Then, Andrew began to have problems at work due to the fact that the management of the firm, where he had worked quite faithfully as an accountant, was seen in tax evasion. As a result, Andrew Clark also fell into the hands of the tax police. Because of the high-profile nature of the case, Andrew was imprisoned on the second day of the investigation, which could not but affect the condition of his wife. The investigation dragged on for six months involving more and more new figures in the case. Experiencing anxiety for her husband, Ashley, for a time, forgot about their own problems and even stopped the treatment, which seemed to her useless and extremely painful. Not taking the medication was a mistake that cost the poor woman her life. As it happens, Ashley died five days before the trial, at which her husband Andrew was later acquitted. In fact, Andrew Clark was not guilty of anything, but his cunning employers deliberately made him the culprit of all the troubles. Andrew, mad with grief, could not even get to the funeral of his wife and was released after her funeral. 
Thus, by the will of an evil fate, Carrie almost ended up back in the walls of the orphanage. During this time, the girl has become very attached to Ashley and Andrew, who have become her real parents. Widowed, Carrie's foster father fell into a severe depression, from which it was very difficult to get out. Alcohol only exacerbated mental anguish for the departed spouse. Andrew had to go through a lot before he could find the strength to move on. Only four years after Ashley's death, Andrew decided to start a new relationship. During this time, he was able to establish his own business and open a small firm selling building materials. Andrew's new chosen one, Susan embodied the image of a woman who knows exactly what she needs from life and therefore immediately considered the benefits of a possible association with a promising widower with a business acumen. Thus, by the will of the fate of the villain, Carrie has found a third mother, which in fact became her stepmother. She didn't consider her a relative at all, but she was obliged to treat her with respect. And Susan herself, frankly, did not like her stepdaughter, who seemed to her arrogant and very withdrawn. When Susan came to the house, Andrew did not stop loving Carrie and, just as before, considered her his own blood. Except that the new wife did not share Andrew's paternal feelings and at every opportunity stressed the fact that his daughter was adopted. But no matter how hard Susan tried to drive a wedge into the relationship between her husband and his adopted daughter, they still considered themselves kinsmen. Two years passed. Carrie had just turned 17 when an event occurred that changed their lives beyond recognition. It all began when Susan suddenly suggested that Carrie go to visit her distant relatives. Just imagine, Carrie. There's a river. A forest. The cleanest air. It's a dream, isn't it? My Uncle Bernard Smith will show you around. He grew up there and knows every stone, she told her stepdaughter. Knowing her stepdaughter's hobbies well, Susan had no doubt that gullible Carrie would gladly jump at the offer. And with the support of her foster father, the girl set out on a journey inland to the woodsman Bernard Smith. All the more so for a girl who grew up in the city. The captivating beauty of the village seemed a real paradise and universal magic. Carrie stayed for about two weeks, after which she decided to return home. But when only her stepmother met her at the train station, the girl suddenly experienced a sharp anxiety attack. Aunt Susan, why are you alone? And where's Daddy? asked Carrie in surprise. At that moment, the woman turned strangely pale and then answered sharply. First of all, he's not your father, but your guardian. Secondly, you don't have a father anymore. He left us and went away, and we're leaving too to the capital. I don't want to run his firm alone. I'm going to start a new life. At first, Carrie thought she'd misheard her and that it was all just a figment of her wild imagination. But when she looked into her stepmother's eyes, she realized that everything she had said was true. How could it be? Could he have been so cruel to me? He called me his daughter, and then he betrayed me. And he couldn't just leave. Leave the house. The company. Carrie exclaimed, Ah, oh, just like that I quit. Easy. Without too much sentiment and snot. He went to negotiate, and then he took the money and went to his mistress. I'll be damned if he hasn't enough room, you scoundrel, said Susan angrily. The metropolis was not welcoming, and finding a good job for an underage girl was not as easy as she had imagined. Eventually, after trying a dozen jobs, she got a job as a librarian's assistant. Of course, it could hardly be called a dream job. But on the other hand, it was better than nothing at all. Susan, having lured her stepdaughter to the capital, sold the firm and the house of her missing husband in no time, not without the help of others. At the same time, she did not care at all about the fate of Andrew, who could get into trouble. Carrie was uncomfortable asking her stepmother about it. The naive girl believed Susan's words, not even suspecting that she was blatantly lying to her. In this case, the stepmother immediately told Carrie to get a room and live separately. It was a boorish thing for Susan to say, but there was no one to talk her out of it. Apparently, 
She had been looking into Andrew's possessions for a long time, and when he disappeared, she took action. Carrie tried to find out about her missing father, but for a 17-year-old girl, it was an impossible task. Daddy's phone was not in the network coverage area, and after a year of unsuccessful search, the daughter realized that his father really left them forever. In the meantime, the stepmother was spending her spouse's money, who still did not let her know anything about him. Time passed. Carrie grew older and became more and more estranged from Susan, who began to heavily abuse alcohol. Easy money didn't do the woman any good, and in fact drove her to the bottom. At one point, Carrie even began to feel ashamed of her stepmother, who became like a tramp from the train station. And when the girl turned 20, she met the ill-fated Henry, who from the first minutes of communication charmed her with his assertiveness and the scope of his advances. Two years later, the young couple had a baby girl who, as we already know, the new parents named Katie. During this time, only one incident reminded Carrie of her bitter past. Her stepmother's death came as no surprise to her. As a year ago, doctors diagnosed Susan with cirrhosis of the liver in the extremely advanced stage due to excessive alcohol consumption. Treatment and expensive medications did not bring the desired result, and the woman died before her 45th birthday just a week. But what Susan said to her stepdaughter before she died, she can never forget. I'm sorry, Carrie, but you should know. I was a rotten man, and now I repent to you. It won't be long now. But before I die, I want to ease my soul. Andrew, your father. He didn't abandon us. It was me who betrayed him. You see, a week before you arrived, he went to business negotiations with a large sum of money. And I already had a permanent lover, Andrew Jackson's father's companion, whom your father always trusted. I sent you to your relatives, and I gave my lover a sign to act. He slipped the documents to Andrew to sign, and he signed them without looking, because he trusted him. The property was already ours. It was just a matter of time. Andrew set up a business meeting with imaginary entrepreneurs in a neighboring town, and he stayed home, citing illness. On the highway, Andrew was stopped by Jackson's goons, who asked for help with a broken-down car. Your dad didn't even have time to slam the car door before he was hit in the head with a stick, and then I don't know what they did to him. I thought Andrew was going to have the boys kidnap him and hold him for a week, but that's not what happened. I didn't find out the truth until later, and I didn't. I didn't tell you. But I shouldn't have. I know what I've done and how much trouble I've caused. I was not happy anyway, and Andrew left me almost immediately, leaving me with a pittance. To say that Kerry was shocked was to say nothing. All this time she had longed for her father, even though she thought he was an irresponsible coward and a liar. In fact, her adoptive father had become a victim of betrayal himself. By a wicked irony of fate, that hard conversation was Susan's last. She said no more and died two hours after meeting her stepdaughter. After burying her stepmother, Carrie tried to find some information about her foster father, but many years had passed and traces of the man were lost. Most likely he was dead and had been resting in the damp earth for a long time. And now, after all these years, the woman saw before her not an old tramp in the hood, but her foster father, Andrew, who had become her own. Daddy, Daddy, is it you? The woman exclaimed, and to her daughter's great amazement, she rushed to embrace the old man. There was everything. Tears, exclamations of amazement, and much, much joy that accompanied such an unexpected encounter. As it turned out later, Jackson's goons had not killed Andrew, but only seriously wounded him. The situation was made worse by the fact that after his injuries, the man lost his memory and found himself bedridden for months. He was found by locals in a clearing near the village and after a long period of treatment, was put back on his feet. Andrew then fell into a terrible depression from which he was pulled by a former chiropractor. 
It was he who helped Andrew to get out of bed through numerous exercises and courses of massage. Gradually, his memory began to return, but the man only remembered his name and the town where he lived. His father did not stay in the village for long and went to the city to remember at least something else. True, severe headaches still plagued him, and sometimes at the sight of strangers stuttered badly. Unfortunately, his search was unsuccessful. Andrew, out of despair, began to drink. And within a few years, he was so low that he became a street beggar. Moving from place to place, he ended up in the center of the city, which, in his mind, offered a better chance of survival. He had given up drinking now, but he could no longer rewind the past, especially since Andrew was a complete orphan, with no one but his adopted daughter and his betrayed wife, Susan, who by then was herself dead. And now, seeing a grown-up Carrie and his daughter in front of him, the man could not hold back tears and was unspeakably happy to meet her. From the experience and strong emotions, Andrew suddenly regained his memory and remembered his whole past life. Taking Carrie and Kathy by the hand, the man went to his happiness, which he had dreamed of for so long, cold nights in his unheated shack. Andrew knew that from now on his life would be very different, and no one would set him up in such a mean way. What about my granddaughter? She's limping, Dad asked cautiously. It was my fault I didn't keep track. Katie hurt her leg. It was a bad fracture. It didn't heal right. It left her with a limp, Carrie answered sadly. The elderly man sighed and involuntarily slowed down. Frankly speaking, it was unpleasant for Andrew to appear in such an unflattering image in front of his daughter, whom he considered his near and dear. But in fact, that was not the case. Carrie was literally ready to carry her father in her arms, feeling guilty that she couldn't find him sooner. Even though the woman still worked at the library, she had a part-time job and was able to rent a decent place to live. So, together with her father and Katie, they now had room to spare. As soon as Carrie brought Andrew to the house, the ubiquitous neighbors immediately began whispering about it. Look at that. The girl is out of her mind. She brought a tramp into the house. She might steal something, said the local gossip mongers. Trying to ignore them, Carrie got down to business. She filled her father's bathtub, then put a change of clothes, shaving supplies, foam, and lotion next to it. She bought all this at the store since she'd put Henry's things in the trash a long time ago. Well, there you go. That's different. Twenty years younger. If I could find a good job now, I could live, Andrew whispered, running his hand over his shaven cheek. You shouldn't be in such a hurry, Dad. There's still time, Carrie remarked cautiously. But his father didn't want to hear about being a burden on the family. Not only that, Andrew wanted to save up money for Katie's surgery to finally get rid of her limp. The next day, he began his search. Picking up the local newspaper with the classifieds, Andrew Jackson opened it to the last page and began to study the job search column. So, bread truck driver. No, that doesn't work for us. Loader in a furniture store. No, not with my arthritis. The elderly man muttered to himself as he studied the ads. From time to time, he glanced at Katie, who was playing along with Grandpa, saying, Take your time. Look for something better, Grandpa. Andrew Jackson was about to put the paper aside when he saw a very strange ad. Requires a man to work as a watchman in a warehouse. The candidate's age does not matter. For all information of interest, please call the following phone number. Read the man. That's exactly what I like. I'm not afraid of work. The main thing is not to let my health down, the man exclaimed. After calling the phone number listed, Andrew Jackson made an appointment. The employer offered the man a personal tour of the warehouse and working conditions before he went to work. Well, break a leg, Daddy, Carrie whispered and kissed her father on the cheek. Andrew Jackson nodded and headed for the bus stop. The old man timed himself, remembering the rule. Accuracy is the politeness of kings. Even though he wasn't a king himself for a long time, he still adhered to the rule. Never be late. The employer turned out to be a nice young man in his thirties. 
in an expensive suit that looked great on him. You're the one going to work as I understand it. The businessman began first. Yes, it's me, the man replied. My name is Harry Morrison. But you can call me Harry. After all, you're old enough to be my father, suggested the employer and held out his hand first. Andrew Jackson had already filed his own back when he saw a huge, apple-sized mole on the guy's wrist. At that very moment, the man's mind blurred, and the swirls of memory swirled to memory swirled him in a dance of patterns and scenes from his past. There he was, not yet an old man, pulling the arm of a drowning boy who had cramped up a muscle. The vision was so precise and clear that the old man clearly felt the slightly salty taste of river water on his lips. Is something wrong? What are you looking at? asked Harry in surprise. Andrew Jackson took a breath in his chest and whispered, On your hand. Many years ago, I saved a boy from drowning in the river. He had a birthmark just like yours. Harry's face changed and he turned pale. You could see in his eyes that he understood what the old man was telling him. Jesus. Yes, it was me. You are not mistaken the businessman added in a shaky voice. Large tears rolled down his cheeks, and they made Andrew Jackson's heart beat furiously. How could he have known then, nearly fifteen years ago, that he was saving his future employer? Truly, God works in mysterious ways. Harry hugged Andrew Jackson and led him to his car. Now, now let's go to a restaurant. We'll have lunch, and then we'll see what to do next, the businessman said, kindly opening the doors of his SUV to the old man. I'm embarrassed, really. It's been a long time. What am I to thank for? <laughs> saved and saved, Andrew Jackson mumbled uncertainly. But it was impossible to change Harry's mind. Almost forcibly putting the old man in the car, the businessman started the engine and drove toward the center. Fifteen minutes later, they were sitting in a cozy restaurant, enjoying a delicious lunch prepared personally for them by the chef. It was there that Andrew Jackson, having gotten the hang of it, spoke of what had happened to him in the meantime. He did not forget to mention Susan's betrayal and Katie's granddaughter's limpness. Harry's face grew darker and lighter as the old man went from one piece of news to the next. Yeah, your life is a thriller. You've been through so much. And yet you survived and remained human. Harry summed up the story of his interlocutor. Then, looking into the old man's eyes, the businessman said, I think I can help your grief. The little girl has a long way to go, and she's already limping. I have the money and the connections. I'll make the necessary arrangements and pay for the operation. And for you, Andrew Jackson, I'll give you another job. Much better than this. You've been in business before, haven't you? Why don't you head up the sales department at my firm? They've all stopped catching mice there. Andrew Jackson sat and could not believe what he had just heard. His life was changing, and in the most radical way, home. Andrew Jackson flew as if on wings. After telling his daughter about his meeting with Harry, the man literally shocked her with the news that the businessman had volunteered to help Katie with her surgery. My God, is it really true? What a good man, exclaimed Kerry. Andrew Jackson nodded affirmatively and wiped away a tear. In his life he had seen many things, but this was the first time. He still had before his eyes the frightened face of the boy drowning in the river, who would later become a successful businessman. Now, the old man realized that if he hadn't saved that boy then, he never would have helped his granddaughter Kathy, who was in such a bad situation. By taking care of all the hassle of the surgery and subsequent rehabilitation, Harry kept his word and got everything done just right. Soon. Little Katie was within the walls of a top musculoskeletal trauma clinic, eagerly awaiting her doctor's appointment for surgery. Each morning, crossing off the day that had passed on her calendar, Kathy was getting closer to the long-awaited date. All the while, she was with her mother and Uncle Harry, 
who unwittingly was caught up in a whirlwind of events that stemmed from his past. Fortunately, thanks to the professionalism of the doctors and the latest treatment techniques, the surgery was successful. As the orthopedist said on the second day of treatment, Katie will dance at her parents' wedding. Watching her daughter take her first steps, Carrie couldn't hold back her tears. At that moment, she wanted to scream to the world with happiness. After so much ordeal, the woman let the tears flow. And for the first time in her life, they were not tears of grief or resentment. The past passed before her eyes like an express train speeding away. Harry also did not stand aside and bought Kathy a new bike to motivate her to get well as soon as possible. Unobtrusively, the businessman felt the problems of Carrie and her daughter, who had become family to him. By the time Kathy was discharged from the hospital, Harry had already become a true guardian angel for the Govorov family. Looking at this merry trio, Andrew Jackson caught himself thinking that perhaps this is the very happiness of which every man on earth dreams. About two months after being discharged from the clinic, Harry and Carrie played a lavish wedding, the scope of which shocked many residents. Kathy, as promised by the orthopedist, learned a fun and energetic dance, which caused a flurry of applause from invited guests. Laughing cheerfully, Katie hugs her mom and dad, whom she loves more than anything. 